Good evening, everyone. Oh, you did that very well. Thank you. Um, welcome to the continuation of the 16th annual Season of Faith and Life uh, lecture events. We're glad you're here. Um, I always like to ask at the outset of these events, oh, I'm Pastor Tim Westermeyer, by the way, one of the pastors here at St. Paul Pedican. Um, many of you, I'm gonna guess, have been at one of these events in the past, but I always like to ask, are there any first time Faith and Life attendees here tonight? Lovely, excellent, good. Special welcome to all of you. We're glad that you're here. Um, if you have been following this series for a long time, um, you will know that we've had all kinds of different speakers. That's sort of the whole point of this series is to bring in people who are Christian and but who di do different things in their everyday lives and who can discuss the way that their work connects to their faith. Um, so we have had authors, we've had uh, politicians, not many politicians, but we did have once, one. one. Um, <laughs> Uh, we've had doctors, we've had lawyers, uh, we've had speakers, we've had business people and entrepreneurs. Um, tonight's speaker is actually someone who we've uh, thought about inviting actually for a few years. I didn't mention this to her. Um, and honestly, I don't remember the thing that prompted it ultimately, but last year, you know, when we, we planned these a year out at least, and we got onto her radar or she got onto ours and we started corresponding and we're delighted that she was able to be with us. Um, she is a Episcopalian priest. She's been at a church at Vanderbilt or a chapel at Vanderbilt that's part of the diocese there. Is that what you call it? Just no. say whatever. It's fine. Uh, what's that? Just make it up. Make it up. All right. <laughs> anyway, she's it been at that church. It makes it more fun if you can just embellish it. Embellish it. Okay. Yes. She's the head chaplain there, actually. <laughs> that's the truth. Um, and has been for about 20 years. She's also the founder of Thistle Farm, which is selling a number of goods. She will talk about that tonight. One of the things that I always like to do, though, for these events, because you can read her bio or find her on Google, is lift up one or two things that you maybe don't know about our speaker. So one thing you won't know is that tonight is her son's uh, first album release party in Nashville. I know. Um, his name is Levi Humman, and the album name is Patient, so thank you for being here instead of there, but go check him out if you'd like. Is it a law in Nashville that you have to release an album? I think it is. Isn't it part of the legal system down there? Yeah. Um, the other thing that you will not know about her, I'm guessing, um, is something she shared with me tonight, which is that I, she can tell how many years ago this was, but she was part of a band uh, that was started and led by her husband, now husband, named, his name is Marcus Humman. The name of the band is Pretty Red Wing. This is before they were married and even before they were dating, and she got kicked out of the band as a backup vocalist, but that set in motion the relationship that led to her marriage, and I presume to Levi. Um, so anyway, you can talk to, to her about that after this. We're glad you're here. Will you please help me welcome Becca Stevens. Tim, thank you. It was actually worse than that. We had just started dating. He invited me to come and sing background. He had a band that was going to, um, they call them, um, it's basically you just do a tryout for a record company. And the only reason he said he asked me to help out was that he really wanted to date me. <laughs> and then once we started dating, he revealed to me that I had no talent for singing. <laughs> But we just celebrated 30 years of marriage, which is awesome. And I don't think I ever, ever, ever sang with him since. But we've had this beautiful marriage of getting to pursue our creativity and our passions and support each other and continue on this road. And what I wanted to do tonight is really just give you five tips I've learned during that whole time because... Um, for about 25 years now, I had it in my head that I wanted to really start a sanctuary for women who were coming off the streets from trafficking, prostitution, addiction, and do things really loving in a beautiful way. And kind of what I've learned from that 
And the very first thing I wanted to share is that I think that the only way to do this work in our lives, this work of justice, and to do it well is to live in gratitude, to simply live in gratitude for all the good, for all the bad. The way I've heard it expressed the best is life is a gift and our um, morality is gratitude. There's the story in um, Luke's Gospel of the leper that returns to give thanks, and Jesus says to him, your faith has made you well. That he equates gratitude with faith. That we get, at least for me, I have done so poorly in the institutional church, by the way, which is why I've been a chaplain. Not even a head chaplain (laughs) for lo these many decades. But if we can equate gratitude with our faith, It seems like that we can relax a little bit about where we are on the journey. For me, my journey started out, and I have to figure out how to go backwards, started out, um, my dad was an Episcopal priest, they were from New York, they came down to Nashville, Tennessee, he got called to start a little mission church, and you know, my mom didn't really want to move, they were we had, they had five kids, she was 35, and then they moved to Nashville, and then he was killed by a drunk driver that same year. And so my mom at 35 was left with five kids and, um, you know, lost. And that's how we all got these southern accents born in Connecticut and New York. <laughs> Couldn't go anywhere. And so... You know, it could have been really bad. It was bad. We were thrown into poverty. Um, A guy that was one of the elders in the church took us on to help us and began to sexually abuse me in the church, and that went on for years, which is what happens is when kids have one trauma, then other traumas pile on top of it. You get this vulnerability in your life. Poverty helps with that. Injustice systems helps with that, racism helps with that, whatever the different injustices are. But I had this mother that was incredibly grateful. She's the kind of person that, like, if you, she would take, it would be a big deal, she would take all five of us to the movie theater. And if there wasn't any parking and you had to park really far away, she'd go, in this lucky you get all your energy out before we get there? And if you found like a parking place really close, you would go, isn't this amazingly lucky we're parking so close? Like it didn't matter what was happening, it was a gift. And she always used to say that the five kids were the biggest gift, that she never had to wonder why she had to get out of bed in the morning after all this stuff had happened in our family, that we were the gift, not the burden. And to start life that way, thinking you are a gift no matter what, makes you remember that the story of the tragedies aren't the story, that there is this beautiful, hopeful story even in that. I mean, I always knew I didn't want my story to be um, the story of just falling apart and um, not doing well. I wanted it to be a story about love. I wanted my story to be a love story. And God was never a problem in my story. Of all the different issues I've had in my life, and I've had several, um, God wasn't one of them. My mom taught me well that God was love and that God was with us wherever we were. Now, my dad was a very, very conservative priest. He believed, he died in 1968, so he believed that the end of the church would be if women were ever allowed to be acolytes. (laughs) And... That's the truth. And, you know, um, he was a compassionate person, a nice person, but I never read any of his sermons. I didn't know anything about him. Uh, My mom gave away most of his stuff um, after his death, but when I got ordained, she gave me his 1928 prayer book, which was no longer even used in church, in churches since 1979. And when she gave it to me, I knew it was like a really special gift that I could understand a little bit about my dad. And if you looked in the prayer book that he gave me, all the services that were public services, baptism, communion, marriages, burials, all those pages were perfectly intact. But it was the daily prayers that are in the prayer book in the Episcopal Church that were worn completely thin and held together by scotch tape. 
And it really taught me all I really wanted to know and needed to know about my dad. That he had this practice, this daily practice of starting his day and ending his night, the morning prayers and the evening prayers, giving thanks. And I thought, that's how I want to live. I want to have this faith that I practice every day, and I want it to be about gratitude. But, you know, it's, it's hard to, for all of us, I think, when we live in gratitude to go ahead and put ourselves there. We have this thing that people tell us that we have to live this balanced life, which is enough to stress anybody out and drive anybody crazy. I gave up balance so long ago, it's unbelievable. <laughs> it's like, all I got to do is just surrender to this day and be grateful. That's what we have to do to surrender to this day, what lies before us, and find gratitude. And that's a way to kind of shape the rest of it. You know, if you make time for God, God makes time for everything else, they say. You know, it's like, to me, it's never made any difference how many kids you have. If you have one or four, you're busy. You know, if you don't, if you have one job or four jobs, you're busy. Everybody's busy. It's busy. So it's like, that's not, it's not going to help to, to um, think we don't have to be busy. We are going to be busy. And the idea of filling it by the busyness starting with gratitude and just some space to remember that for this day is a way to keep us going. And I think that's what's kept me going for decades. So when I started out, what I wanted to do was really start a place that was going to be a sanctuary for women. I had the idea in my head. I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted it to be two years rent-free with no authority in the house. I wanted us to offer sanctuary like we offer church, something beautiful. You know how we build cathedrals beautifully, and then we build really um, crappy shelters? (laughs) But what if we built the shelter as beautiful as a cathedral? What would that be like? How would that be somewhere where people could actually feel inspired and healed and whole and have no stress about money, make it completely free? I've never met a woman coming off the streets in any of the cities I've been in that has a penny to their name. In our family, money was the biggest stress we had. There was this much money and this much bills. You know, and our strategy as kids, when it was time for the bills to be paid, is scatter. You don't want to be near it. It was awful. Um, We knew that um, we wanted it to be two years where you had plenty of time. It was, to me, it felt like two years was enough time to fall in love with a therapist, to hate the therapist, and then fall in love again. You know, you could, that takes you through that journey of getting somewhere new where you're willing to trust enough to change. And then the last thing was really to have this, in this beautiful image in my mind of sanctuary was to have no authority. If you have a history of especially child sexual abuse or many, many childhood traumas, you know that authority is a big trigger. You know, tell me what to do and I promise you I'll do the opposite. Or if I can't do the opposite, I'll cry or I'll run. I'll do any of those things, but I'll be panicked. When I was going through divinity school, I had this goal of going to my quarterly meetings with the bishop and not crying in those meetings. And I never made that goal. So I knew that if there was going to be a place of healing, it needed to be where we had this shared authority, where it was not about empowering women, it was just we were going to love each other. And we were going to recognize each other's authority. But the problem was it was like my husband was on the road with Columbia Records, I had already had one baby, I was pregnant with another, and I thought, I just can't really do it. I can't do these ideals I have about sanctuary and hopefully about someday opening up uh, um, um, a justice enterprise where women can work and make money. And um, so what I settled for was doing a feeding program with women. And we would go out to the streets and we would just do feeding programs and there were thistles everywhere and I knew that if I ever made this place, I was gonna call it Thistle Farms. Thistles were the last flower growing where the women were walking and turning tricks and sleeping in the alleys. It would grow up through the chain link fences around prisons. 
And it was like, this was called a noxious weed. That's what thistles are. It has a history of survival by brutality. It has the deepest taproot. It can survive floods and droughts. It's amazing. People despise it. And yet, it has this beautiful purple center. And I've always been drawn to the thistle. My mom's wedding china actually has thistles on it. And so I had this idea, and we would walk down the streets, and i think, someday, someday, and I wouldn't do it. So while I was down there feeding, doing a homeless program, feeding folks, and I was getting my son, the one that's releasing the record tonight, I was trying to get him in the car after the feeding program was done. And where the feeding program was, it was out in front of a strip club, and it's one of the older strip clubs in Nashville, Tennessee, called the Classic Cat. Um, when you're in Nashville and you tell this story... If you say, y'all know where the classic cat is, I promise you this happens. The women go, "Mm mm-hmm, and men are like, never heard of it. (laughs) No idea. And it's like, you do know where it is. It's right at the corner of 8th and Broad. You drive by it. I know you know where it is. Anyway, I was trying to get my son in the car, and I was like pushing him in the car seat, and he was doing that four-year-old thing that they do where they go like, And it's almost like it's like Olympic strength back bends. And I couldn't get him in, and what I realized is that his head is up looking, and he's looking at the big billboard in front of the classic cat. And the woman is dressed in a memory of a cat suit. Almost nothing. With tails and ears, and she's smiling just to beat the band. And he says, Why is that lady smiling? And I thought the question was so innocent and beautiful, it about broke my heart. And I thought, someday he's not going to ask that question. It's going to seem completely normal to him that we do this to women, that we commodify them, that we dress them up in cat suits and sell them for less than you can probably sell a cat. And that it's not going to, and we want her to smile the whole time it's happening to her. You know, if you flew into Nashville, You could drive down the interstate and see the sign for the world's largest adult bookstore, and you drive a little farther, you could see another big billboard for another strip club called Deja Vu that doesn't even have a woman's head. It's just her crotch and legs. And that was the day I decided I'm going to start Thistle Farms. So I got busy, and I figured out how to keep this idea that I had relevant, practical, and scalable how to grow it as both a movement and a business, how to make it a place of hospitality, mold it into a justice enterprise, keep growing it so it had a legacy, to remember always that I came as a beggar and I was grateful for this work. Those were the principles I started with. We started with one house. We invited five women. We have an amazing group of women with us tonight from Thistle Farms. Regina, who is out, is she here or out there at the table? There's Regina. Can you stand up and wave at everybody? She came to the community in 1997. Um, She was one of the first five residents. She went on to um, help launch many more houses. She's now the National Outreach Survivor, um, Survivor Outreach and Advocate. We have, you know, grown and grown, and she has been here the entire time welcoming and helping people. And as it's grown, we have started Thistle Farms, the um, social enterprise, what we realized is if we were going to talk about this love and gratitude, we had to be concerned about people's economic well-being, right? You had to. And we wanted to make something really healing for the body. I mean, the women, everybody I served had been raped, everybody, 100%. And the idea to make something really healing for the body that we could do and it would make sense that we could make margins on these products and we could grow it into this business. So we developed and then um, we started a national network. I mean, part of the reason we're so glad to be here with you guys is that last night we got to be a part of another community that's bringing in, starting a new place called um, Northside Healing Center. And they're just renovating to be a sanctuary for women survivors of 
sexual violence and exploitation right here in this community. But there's more than 220 long-term free beds now that we refer women across the country to, that we share best practices. Regina organizes conference calls and education days, and we kept growing, and we kept growing all over the world. We had people calling us from all over the world. Can you help us? And we started learning about the universal truths around sexual assault and how individual women carry that on their bodies. And how the truth is you rape a woman and you kill a village and you heal a woman and you heal a village. And so we kept growing and we kept going. My family grew. And this past year, we just reopened a cafe. It's one of our um, four enterprises in Nashville, Tennessee. And it's been this sweet um, coming home in a lot of ways. We've welcomed more than 50,000 people into the cafe this year. And it's just this beautiful testimony about how people will come a long way for a beautiful healing cup of tea and a cup of coffee and to taste hope and love. That's what we're, you know, it's cultivating a palate for that and engaging people. So our son, in the meantime, is growing up in this community. He's growing up with all the women of Thistle Farms. He's learning what it means to really love and respect people and celebrate and live in gratitude. And so he made his first video. It was called Love Heals after our motto at Thistle Farms. And he came to the cafe and filmed it. He and my husband wrote the song. I, I wanted him to grow up to be a, a, a priest. <laughs> my husband wanted him to grow up to be a songwriter. And um, I remember when he was five and we asked him, you know, what do you want to do when he, you grow up? And he said, I think I want to be a dog. <laughs> and, my, and my husband said, well, you could be a priest. And he said, ooh, no, that's a girl job. <laughs> so he wrote this song for us, and I want to play it for you, called Love Heals, and it's Allison Krauss singing background. And all the women who helped raise him at Thistle Farms have our lip syncing with him. No. For 21 years, Thistle Farms has been a witness to the truth that in the end, love is the most powerful force for change in the world. Hate kills, birds fly, rocks roll, and tears cry, and love, love heals. Whiskey burns, and records scratch. Wheels turn, sparks catch, and love, love heals. Oh, I've never seen a broken heart, one shattered and torn apart, that could not come back together. So heavy, couldn't stand on legs unsteady, and one day run light as a feather. Baby, here's a deal. Love he. Sunsets, sunsets, suns rise, suns rise, on regrets and alibis. Dreamers dream, some dreams come true, we're caught between a hell that's coffee black and heaven that's sky blue. Oh, I've never seen a broken heart. One shattered and torn apart They could not come back together Oh, I've never known a life so heavy Couldn't stand on legs 
unsteady And one day run by as a feather Baby, here's a deal Everything that's shiny One day gets broke It's some kind of mystery But this much I know Love Love he So the second thing that I am learning on this work of justice and faith and trying to be as faithful as I can be is that we have to mind our own bodies and spirits. I think so many times we forget we have bodies. That we ignore if we're tired, we ignore if we are fearful, we ignore all these things that happen in our lives and that we can do this justice work and really be present in our bodies. And I learned it because I love baths. I love bathtubs more than anything. Does anybody else love a bath? Again, all the women are going to go, mm-hmm, and all the men are going to go, no, I've never had one. They're really good. I'm just going to invite everybody in this room at some point, just go get some beautiful bath salts from Thistle Farms probably. Let's just say in general what y'all did before this, our talk was a great round one of shopping. <laughs> now we're going to really shop once we're done with this. We're really going to go out there and finish all our holiday, all our Christmas shopping. It's going to be done. You are going to coast into Thanksgiving more peaceful than you've ever been. And you're also going to pick up something for yourself. So I was taking baths and I was thinking about how it is that... Um, you know, we could make money off doing the things we love. And that was when it was like, we could do bath salts, we could do body bombs, we could do healing oils. And there's something like 425 scriptures on healing oils. And I realized for me what it was, was coming to that very, very small, sweet spot where arts and crafts and justice come together in body care products. I'm really good at that. And I had no idea. But I think all of us have those spaces where you go, I have energy around this. I love this. I can offer this as my faith and my justice work. In this space, I have energy. I feel grounded. I feel happy. I go to bed with more ideas than I woke up with. And that's the place we got to go. Because I think, again, what you think is like, okay, we have to do all this. And then the justice work is added on to it, so I'm going to be tired and kind of miserable and exhausted. But if we get, begin in the place where we, like, mind how we're feeling, we remember ourselves, and we pull ourselves together and remember what it is we love and offer that, that becomes, you know, real worship. It becomes this beautiful gift, and you don't feel put out by doing it. You feel great. The truth is, everything I learned about running a justice enterprise, I learned from the church bazaar. <laughs> everything. I mean, that is the craziest thing in the world, right? And what it is, is everybody goes, okay, we want to raise $1,000 to help this mission trip. Okay, and so we could just say, I'm going to need $1,000 please. And you could ask somebody that you know has a thousand dollars. Or you could say, hey, can the church just give us a thousand dollars out of the budget? But no. No. What we do is this. Okay, everybody go out and spend a thousand dollars on items at Michael's. <laughs> and then make a bunch of stuff. And then bring it and, and we'll set it up and we'll bring it to the church. And then we'll buy each other stuff that we don't want. <laughs> and we'll raise $1,000. And the reason it is so successful and so beautiful is because so much more happens than that. 
First of all, I get to show you I made this sweater. And you say, that is beautiful. I made this cake. And I go, that is amazing. And we feel good about ourselves and we become friends. And we find people that love the stuff we do and we think we're going to invite 30 more people next year and we're going to grow it. And you don't raise $1,000. You raise $1,000 the first year and $10,000 the next year and $20,000 the next year. And you have a community that is thriving and growing. It is so much more than that. There's this extravagance when we get to bring ourselves to that party. And that's what I think is beautiful, is finding what you're good at. Finding what grounds you and gives you joy and hope. And you offer that. And people say it is beautiful. One of the things at Thistle Farms that I love, the cafe, and and is Angela here? She's sitting outside. There's Angela, everybody. (laughs) Angela is the manager at the cafe, and we run this cafe with the idea that everybody has a story. They come in, we can can exercise our theology of radical hospitality, love without judgment. We can do all that, but we do it by serving really amazing food, and people become chefs and baristas, and like... When Angela manages the whole front of the house, she is a graduate of the program. She has learned this skill set that I could never do in a million years. She's now looking at homes to buy. She's thriving in this justice enterprise because it fits some of her skill sets. While other folks, you know, they're learning machinery and how to make these products and how to, um, you know, really delve into their passion is all I can say that there's enough variety now and that's what I hope for people I mean there's a reason that people come together to do bazaars or do anything sewing bees or do washing their clothes it's like what happens in this when we come present we share stories we share meaning we share histories and we feel healing take place together. I really believe in this community activity where you thrive and other people are thriving and you begin to share stories in space. The next thing is trust that inspiration will come. No matter how great you are, no matter how grateful you are, no matter how grounded you are, it is exhausting sometimes. Amen? Yes. My God, we have to do church again. I know you've never said that. Once. (laughs) And the truth is nobody cares if you feel that way, right? Nobody says, oh, you don't feel inspired to do church today? Stay home, relax. We got it. No, deliver a sermon. That's what we pay you to do. Get up and dazzle us about the gospel. (laughs) My kids have never once, three sons, never once asked me, Mom, are you inspired to make dinner tonight? (laughs) Or if you're at school... Don't turn in a paper. That book wasn't inspiring to you. Don't worry about it. No, you have to do it. You have to show up and you have to keep doing it. And the best lesson I've learned is if I can keep doing the work, whether or not I'm inspired, that I will come again. That the inspiration will come again. I don't need to panic. I don't think it need, I have to worry about being burned out. I just have to trust it's coming that the spirit is close. Um, I learned that lesson. I was out in Omaha last year, starting one of our sister communities, like I said, and we go out and we do the pep talk. We meet with foundations. We talk to the judges. We talk to the police chiefs. We hold church services. We'll do anything to raise enough money to open these beautiful, small communal houses. And we did it. And we went out there in November, and I was feeling completely gray, and everything was gray. The whole sky was gray. The whole four days, three days we were there, it felt like four. And the buildings were gray, and the trees were gray, and the pavement was gray. Everything was gray. And I thought, I just don't know if I can keep doing this. And it's scary when you have that feeling sometimes. And I always travel like, um, with, like I am with so much gratitude to Regina and Angela, with graduates of the program. I was traveling with a woman 
who had um, run away from a foster care home in sixth grade um, from terrible abuse, and she hit the streets. Some of the women that we have served over the years don't even call themselves runaways. They call themselves throwaways because nobody came after them. And then they spend their teenage years in jails and on the, I mean, in detention centers and on the streets. And then when they're 18 years old, we graduate them to prison. And Sophia was one of those folks, and she was with me on the trip. She was a graduate of the program, and it was her first time flying, and she came and she did a beautiful, beautiful witness to how love heals to so many people. We were flying back on Sunday night, and it was about 8 o'clock at night, and I was trying to be nice to her because she didn't understand that cardinal rule since she hadn't flown before of don't cross the armrest. But she was like, I was kind of sitting like that. And then I realized I was just like this, that she had pushed all the way across. We were about 20, 25,000 feet. And we cut through all the clouds. And everything that was gray was gone. And she was taking pictures out the window of a supermoon. And it was haloed. And those gray clouds now were laced with blues and reds and some purples. And she was leaning against me as she was looking out the window, and she looks up and she said, you know, I didn't know that there was a sky above the clouds. I was like, okay, Sophia, I'm good for another five years. <laughs> you just saved me. You saved me. Because I forget that there are so many people in this world that don't know there's a sky above the clouds that have seen the inside of prison walls and the underside of bridges and the back side of anger and the short side of justice and the mean side of racism and they never have seen the top side of a cloud or gotten to see the beautiful far side of a sunrise from a beach or all these things in our lives that give us this hope and inspiration. And sometimes it takes a community to get an individual there. And I want to be a part of that community. And I know if I keep coming back to the circle, to listening to stories again, and not getting tired, that it will come back. I know that. And our job is to trust that inspiration will come. The other thing I want to say is that the fourth part of this is always that we have to dig deeper. I think sometimes we think we are trying to get the world to love us. And so we try to not be too radical, don't shake the boat too much, don't say anything too much, or, you know, I don't know what to say. Don't stir it up too much, the pot. And the truth is, is that we all know that there's a lot of injustices in this world. And our job as faithful folks is to keep changing you know, it's to love the world in order to love the world, not for the world to love us, but in order for us to love the world, we have to be willing to keep changing, which means we have to keep digging, digging deeper. I'm so scared my southern accent you can't understand me. Digging is D-I-G-G-I-N-G. -G -I, -G. <laughs> In Nashville, we just say digging. It's just digging deeper. But, you know, that's hard. Because maybe some of your belief systems have worked really, really well for you. But always we are called to dig deeper. Always, always, always. And one of my recent experiences of that was going to Greece to work with a group of women refugees. And we haven't really tied well as um, a communities of faith. So far we haven't tied the refugee work and the human trafficking work together very well. But there's over 12,000 young women missing from refugee camps. Women flee the violence and vulnerability, the violence of war, but not the vulnerability of poverty in these camps. There's a lot of um, fear and trauma in the camps. And I was watching um, the videos where women were coming out of Syria. Their husbands had already left. Um, the women had stayed, and they stayed until basically the chemical warfare started. And then they fled. And you saw, y'all saw all those videos of the boats with the life jackets, and they were landing in Greece, and they closed the borders in Greece, so they were receiving blankets from the UNHRC, 
and then they were stuck in camps. And I thought, wouldn't it be beautiful to go over there and start a new program weaving the um, blankets and the life vests into welcome mats? And it could be a new justice enterprise. And the big NGOs, not, um, the not-for-profits we contacted said, you can't do it. You can't hire refugees, you can't pay refugees, and if you just offer nine women, you know, this little bizarre model, you'll have a riot. And I was like, okay, let's try. <laughs> I mean, it was like, okay, we'll be like, okay, I've never been in a riot, let's go. And, you know, it took about three or four minutes for the women to organize themselves and gather and to figure out how the pay was gonna happen through Venmo, and then they took about another 20 minutes for them to figure out all the things that they wanted to spend the money on for the camp, not just for themselves, and how they needed vans, transportation, access to dentists. The same thing anybody wants in this world. I want my kids to be safe. I want some options for decent food. I want health care, just the basic things. And they started weaving, and when we started weaving, they were scared to touch the vests again. They were full of trauma. They started stripping them, and they started telling all these amazing stories. And we just listened to stories for a week. None of them wanted their picture made. Um, we did a video, and we had to blur their faces. And we could only shoot from the waist up, and they had on long... Um, long, it was like borrowed sweaters and it was hot. And we said, maybe we could get some tunics that would be a little bit cooler. Then they decided six months into it, they wanted matching t-shirts with the logo Love Welcomes on it. And we by the time we got back there, this was the photo they wanted. Straight in the camera, arms up. Just by trusting a little bit these ideas when we dig deeper about what injustice looks like. You open up new worlds and new ideas and it does change you. And it does change some of your ideas and some of your opinions. Of the nine women that started in the, in the weaving um, group, all nine of them have um, my, um, immigrated to be with their husbands. They and their children have all been reunited. Um, that they left the camp and they trained other women. They've sold uh, more than 2,000 mats in the first year. And now the problem is they want to have a whole line of products. They have a million ideas. I was like, it's like give a moose a cookie. <laughs> it's crazy. It's like it's growing. And then it's like, okay, now we got to increase the markets. But it's a beautiful thing. So for every time we sell one of these, it's $96. And didn't that look beautiful on your altar, Tim? <laughs> I'm just saying that those are the actual pieces of life vests and the actual blankets. So $96 and $50 goes back to the weavers and $20 goes to pay for the transportation vans and the um, project manager on the ground. And then the other money just goes for the, all the shipping, materials, my wardrobe. <laughs> um, it gets spent really quickly. But what it has done is we've learned to develop a new model in justice enterprise that I want to share with you when we start digging deeper. What we realized is that even fair trade doesn't work for people. Fair trade doesn't work because you can say, okay, the market will allow $3 for a pound of tea for the producer. Now, when by the time it gets over here, that same amount of tea might be 25, 30 bucks. But you do shipping, distributors, wholesalers, and the, you know, it goes on and on and on. But the fair trade price is $3, so I can sell this for $20, but in the right market, it'll sell for $40, $50. That price never changes. And so you can go places and meet tea pickers who are living in rondavels on dirt floors receiving a fair wage. So what we decided to do is when we started really getting into this and developing these markets overseas and saying, okay, let's do it shared trade model, a shared trade model. And what that means is that no matter what this price is, 60% goes back to the producers. 
In order to do that, we have to be the distributor. We have to be the wholesaler. We have to be the shipper. We'll cut out everybody. And so there's less links in the chain so that the consumer and the producer can know that they are healing each other, that they're living in gratitude, that they're minding their body, that they're looking at these issues of justice, and they know that everybody along that line, from the person who receives it to the person who makes it, feels this beautiful gratitude and love. So, the last thing I want to say is the other thing that I think I've gotten caught up on way too much in my life and in this work has been thinking, wow, it's really going great. Or, oh my God, it means nothing. These issues are so big and we are so small. What difference does it make? And when I get that way, I can, um, I can be fearful, I can be cynical, I can be... Um, can I say pissy? <laughs> that. Um, I can be d all kinds of stuff. But when I can believe that the work is just worthy, when I get myself out of it and just look at the work and remember that the work is worthy and that there is something that is communal and beautiful that is happening, that I'm part of some of the oldest news in the world about how love heals and communities have been doing this a long time. And individual visions are not that big a deal. Like when people come and say, like, I have this vision for a home for women. And you're like, okay, people have had that for hundreds of years. You know, we've been living in community. The Benedictine model was a huge part of what established our community about radical hospitality, about the, the most honored person is the newest resident. All of those are really old ideas. The corporal acts of mercy, give drink to the hungry. No. Thirsty. <laughs> give drink to the thirsty, food to the hungry, clothes to the naked, visit the prisoners, comfort the sorrowful, welcome the stranger, bury the dead. That's what we do. That's not new. But this idea of a communal vision coming together, that this justice work is community work. I believe that when Jesus said, pick up your cross, he was speaking to a community. It's not about an individual dragging this huge burden around. It's about all of us falling in love and joining together and getting a chance to do this work and believe that it is worthy. That's it. And the truth is that our investment in small community work and our small justice work pays back and is a great return on investment. One of the things I love is that we built a home for a million dollars for eight women in Nashville, Tennessee that can stay free for two years. And it seems so extravagant and lavish. And it seems so small and nothing at the same time. And when you do the math on it, We've saved the city of Nashville just by that one house more than two and a half million dollars since it was built. We can do all of it for like half the cost to put a woman in prison. We can be creative and hopeful and small and not cynical and loving one another. But we need each other to do it. We need to remember that our justice work is a non-competitive sport. You don't know how many places that we've gone and they're like, oh no, we have a woman's shelter. And I'm like, that's like saying, like if I came to you and said, I have a new Mexican restaurant, oh, we have a Mexican restaurant. It's like you, ha you can have more than one Mexican restaurant in a town we have learned. <laughs> you can have all kinds of beautiful models. There, we have never had less than 100 women on our waiting list, ever. It is always people dying to find homes. There are thousands of women who want to come in. But to find that space is a real luxury. So what we have to keep doing for me, I have to keep believing in the work. I have to keep believing I can do it this year and I can do it this year. And we'll grow this movement in a beautiful and good way. Now I've lost the clicker because I got so excited. So my last slide. When it comes down to it for all of us, I think, 
It is about community and communion and coming together and loving each other. That's what I think it is. I think sometimes we make it so complicated. I am so, so glad that I started this work before there was ever anything called a social enterprise. I don't think I ever would. In my mind, it was just like we make stuff, we sell stuff. And that's the truth about this work. All of it, for all of us and you and your life, it, like, it can be so simple. You can love me, and I can love you. And somehow, if we can love each other, we will find our way to God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We should have invited you a long time ago. <laughs> that was great. Thank you. Um, she's going to rest her voice for just a second. You will have a chance to ask her some questions at the mic to my right or to my left, so be thinking of some questions to ask. Uh, before then, a few announcements. I want to lift up the next event in this series. Um, this is now late October, so we'll get through November, December, and even January, which is busy. Um, and the next event will be uh, with a gentleman named uh, Richard D'Souza, who grew up in India, um, studied in Europe, is now a, a, a astronomer at the Papal Observatory and doing postdoctoral work at the University of Michigan. Uh, he's a Jesuit priest who, in his own being, uh, connects faith and science, which has been one of the themes we've come back to a few times in this series, and he's going to be awesome. So please join us for that. That's on February 7th. Uh, if you would like us to remind you about that event, you can join our email list or like us on Facebook and we'll uh, get information out to you uh, about that and other future events. Um, these events, uh, Becca talked about gratitude. Uh, she actually, she was really sweet. We, I spend a little time with all of our speakers before these events, and we were in my office, and she said, so do you like doing these things, or are they kind of a pain? Um, <clears throat> which is an honest question. What? I shouldn't have said that? No, no. I said I didn't say that. What? I think it's, I just wondered if you love it still. I do. I'm so glad. Yeah, and um, I think of that because of that theme of gratitude, and um, I'm so grateful to be able to do this work in part because we can invite wonderful people like Becca here. I'm grateful to all of you for taking time out of busy schedules to come and hear a wonderful speaker talk about important things, and I'm profoundly grateful to all the people who make this possible financially from the start of this series. I've said this at every event. Uh, so now, you know, for 16 years, this has never been a budget item of the church. It's always funded entirely through the amazing generosity of individuals and corporations and other organizations. Um, I'm not going to read all the names on here. They're listed here. But many of those folks are here tonight. Will you join me in thanking them for making these events possible? Um, I also, I do want to thank Michael and Green, I don't know where they are, are they out in the narthex? Uh, for 16 years, Jeff Elstead has been our intro and outro musician, guitarist. Uh, he reached out to me yesterday, he had a small, he, he's fine, his family's fine, but there was a little minor medical emergency, and so at the last minute I asked Michael Morris and Green Buzard, who play for our 11 o'clock and Monday night service here, if they would join us and share their music, and they were kind enough to do that, so thank you to Michael and Green, we're grateful to you. <laughs> and we, I mean this sincerely too, we are very careful about not turning these events into some kind of bait and switch for other events, but I will just mention, if you, if you like beer and if you like singing hymns, uh, next Tuesday evening at the Wyzetta Brew Works, we're having, the, I don't know, we've done this now a couple years, are next in the installment of our Beer and Him events, and Michael and Green lead that, and it's a ton of fun. Uh, this one, I think the theme is Saints and Sinners in honor of All Saints Day, so again, Tuesday night, October 30th, Wyzetta Brew Works, 7 o'clock. Be there if you're interested in either singing or drinking beer. Um, <clears throat>
or both. You don't have to do either. You can just come and whatever. I'm going to be quiet about that. Um, okay. Now we're going to take some questions. So you can come on back up. And um, I think what I'm also going to do, you know, we turn the lights down a little bit lower so that you could see some of the stuff on the screen. I'm going to go back and turn the lights up a bit so that you can see each other a little bit better. And I'll be back in a minute. So again, Mike there and there, uh, please come and um, remember to use the right uh, punctuation, which means your question should end in a question mark and you're not coming up to give a statement, okay? You can totally make a comment. That's okay. All right. Well, that's fine. <laughs> the, uh, I want to say, too, though, that if some of you want to talk a little bit more afterwards, we're going to be out there. We will sell products. We will be, I'll be signing, happy, happy to sign books. And also, if you have more questions just really about the depth of the program of Thistle Farms or how, you know, like really in-depth questions, those are best if you can, you know, we have pamphlets out there. We have education days. All of those kinds of really hard questions we can do later. Yes. Uh, Becca, that is a beautiful sweater. Thank you. Uh, I want to know if you knit the socks that you put yes. on after you got done speaking. I did knit my socks. Is there a reason you were barefoot wow, before? Wow, thank you for noticing. <laughs> I know I can't do bare feet in Minnesota. You can do it in Tennessee, but it's colder here. I believe in bare feet. I think it grounds you, and it's kind of a nice way to start. And there's an old tradition of decalced folks who are barefoot in honor of the folks walking the streets. So it's a beautiful old tradition. I think it dates back to about Moses. But people don't practice it enough, I don't think. But also, it's also comfortable. No. That's good. That means that we have time to shop. <laughs> oh, we have one more question. That's perfect. I'm just wondering if you ever had any pushback about establishing a home in a neighborhood. Have neighbors objected? You no, know, the or? first house that we open was on my street because I never wanted anybody to say not in my backyard so it was like literally I lived on Park Avenue in Nashville Tennessee and it was on Park Avenue and the house was a gift we renovated it um, it's not considered it's not a shelter it's not a halfway house it's not a treatment center it's just a home it's considered permanent housing because it's more than 18 months and so it's just like four people living together in a home and at that point, we didn't have to even have any code changes because it was enough bedrooms for the number of women living there that it, it had, didn't have to go through any code changes. So people moved in. I never even asked anybody permission. And then, <laughs> and then there was a, uh, and then by the only complaints we've had in neighborhoods, I promise you this is true. The only complaints we've had is that property values have risen in the neighborhoods where we are. We are amazing neighbors. We have the most exquisite gardens. We have full renovations. We have showers for every house um, where different churches adopt different every single room and decorate it to the nines. I mean, they're, Regina, it's beautiful homes, aren't they? Stunning homes. And so we do it um, and we build, whenever we build, we do it environmentally so we don't remove anything we're not supposed to be removing and we have architects that come in and design like the house that I was talking about it looks like almost like a butterfly it has vaulted ceilings with the idea that it's renewal and life with interior gardens so we haven't the only time I ever got pushback we bought a building on Charlotte Avenue which is close to downtown Nashville Tennessee to make our bath and body care products and I got a call from the council person in the neighborhood saying there was some concern about us opening this business. Mind you, we bought a really crappy building <laughs> that had, um, it had had like a beauty shop thing that had shut down, and it had had a donut place. And it was going to be perfect for our manufacturer. And he called me, and he said there were some concerns in the neighborhood. And I said, you know, we can start this conversation over if you start with thank you. And I said, you know, I've never had pushback. I've had the governor, I've had our congressmen, I've had council people, and they do nothing but thank us for the work. Your community is safer, the women are safer, all because we are loving each other. 
And I said, so we can start over and you can say thank you, and now you can invite us to the homeowners meeting where the people are concerned, and we will come in, and everybody's going to buy products. <laughs> and you're going to have, you're going to, like, welcome us properly into this neighborhood. Okay. And he said, yes, ma'am. <laughs> I mean, it was like, are you kidding me? This is what you want. We want the community to love women and thrive. Let's talk. You know, like, yay, that's the, what you want. And again, we've brought, we bring in easy a million dollars a year in revenue and in savings to the city of Nashville. So that was such a long answer. No, we didn't get pushback from neighbors. <laughs> Thank you. Um, can I ask one more? Do you ever have women that leave before the two years are up, and then do you try to reach out to them again to bring we them We have women back who in? leave. We have about 80% of the women who come in graduate um, two years. Um, we have women during that two years that relapse. You know, for some folks, relapse is a part of a recovery, whether it's in a, you know, what we generally say is women relapse over a relationship before they relapse over a drug. Um, but they come back. They come home. Um, yeah, but women leave also if they, a lot of times if folks get custody of children they have, they'll want to get an apartment, have, you know, a safer place. It takes a long time to get custody of your kids because usually you owe back child support. You have to, you know, really be settled and grounded and you know, ready to be a mom again, but when women get custody of their kids back, they'll generally move out and become affiliates of the program, but you can still graduate the program. So I will say that we have samples of products from many, many of our partners around the globe. It's just a few products from a lot of different folks, so you can just kind of get a feel for it. This, the book, Love Heals, is the most recent book, and it really is full of images and um, it has the idea of all the different ways that love heals in our lives, but it, it draws on the experience of Thistle Farms. There's poetry in it, there's scripture in it, and it has the history and our spiritual principles we um, go by in the back of the book, so I'll recommend that to you. But other than that, just know that we are so, so grateful. It is, this is a huge event for us, and I'm just so excited to hear what your next thing is that you're pointing me at about. I forgot. Oh, well, I... Are there, if there are no more questions, we'll... Oh, we do have another one. Okay, okay. this will be the last one, right? What? Is it, how long do we ask questions on? How we'll long, long do they ask questions? Do we questions? go, like, forever? We're doing fine on time, okay. yeah. yeah. Um, could you just repeat the organization you helped yesterday up here? Um, I'm a 15-year mentor. And no, you can go up and say it. You're here. <laughs> this is Kathy Bogey. That she's Hi, part of that community? I'm um, from St. John's Episcopal Church in South Minneapolis, but we're partnered with Liberty Presbyterian Church on the north side, and they're working, um, they're reinvigorating an organization called Northside Healing Space. Northside Healing Space. Yeah. Thank you. And we can talk okay. later. Okay, thanks. Hi. Hello there. Is there a way we can get your son's CD? How do we do that? Oh. Yes, I, I don't. Um, I don't have them, but um, it's easy. Just download it on iTunes. It's just called Patient Levi Hummin. He'll be very happy you asked that question. <laughs> the funny thing is, is that your son is married to a woman who is the sister of one of my interns that graduated, and she became. So we were thinking that where she's part of the family. She was a huge part of helping us grow Thistle Farms. After she was an intern, she went on to work and help. She's just, now she's a midwife, so we're all family now. Um, Becca is one of the, I heard Becca speak the day after you got back from Greece, your Easter sermon, oh. when you just got off the plane. She is an amazing lady, and if, if however you can support her and what she does, mm. and if you ever get to Nashville, this cafe is not in West Nashville, it's in East Nashville. There's a difference, and um, our son lives in East Nashville, that's how I know. Um, but she's amazing, absolutely amazing. What she's done is amazing. The people, 
everything is just so amazing and you have prayers from all over and I hope that all of us pray and support what Becca's doing because I, I have been asking around I don't and the the what you're talking about maybe is one of the first things individual churches individual people are doing shelters but it's not what you do so thank you all right so as she has mentioned there are things for sale so buy lustily or whatever um at this point all i typically do is i come up and i say thank you and i give our speaker a gift tonight we're going to make it a little more complicated and this is going to involve all of you i am going to give becca a gift and say thank you and then Amanda's going to come up here, who's on our staff, and Becca and I are going to stand right around here, and Amanda's going to take a picture of all of us together so that you can do, I don't know, whatever you're going well, to do with it. Well, my whole thing is that I do think that investing, a.k.a. shopping, is awesome. It does. We've had 87,000 hours this year of work for women survivors, 87,000 hours. But in addition to that, one of the things that we really want to encourage people to do is to be advocates in any way you can, and a really easy way is through social media. And so what we want to do is we want to show that there is support for women survivors here in Minnesota, and one of the great ways to do it is to do that through an image. We'll post it um, I, on my account, Becca Stevens. We'll also post it on Thistle Farms, and, you know, Follow us, tag us, share it yourselves, and the idea is that we keep generating energy and momentum, and hopefully, too, you'll be talking about things that you feel passionate about and continue to advocate, too, but that's the way, you know, sometimes I think if I thought that just swiping left on your phone that the news feed I read was the actual news in this world, I might die. But knowing that there are people that are coming together and sharing that good news. So we're going to also not only do that, but we're going to be really excited when we do it. <laughs> okay. All right. So here's the thank you part. And thank you all for coming out as well. Again, I mean that sincerely. And please tell other people about the series, and we'll see you again in February. In the meantime, for Becca, we've got a little granite plaque that says, with thanks to Becca Stevens for bringing faith to life. We're so glad you could be with us. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Yeah. All right, and now the picture part. So scoot in, everybody scoot towards Scoots. the middle, and we'll stand up, and then we're able to just, not that far. Not that you far. You this far right. right here. Yes, ma'am. And you're going up here. Are you excited, too? She looks excited. Are you nervous? <laughs> do you see everybody? Yeah, do some really happy, jumpy music. Happy, jumpy music. Okay, wait, like this. Okay, everybody's together, and it's like, woo! Did we get it? No, she's working on it. Okay.